Okay, we are continuing our series, Fix Your Eyes on Jesus, and uh, in the last few weeks we've been looking at Christ in the Gospels, having spent several months earlier this year looking at Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, two weeks ago we looked at the birth of Christ, last week we looked at the deity of Christ, the first, uh, the first one, the first uh, two weeks ago, we spent some time in Matthew and Luke's gospel. And last week, as we looked at the deity of Christ, it uh, featured some of the things that were said in John's gospel. Uh, things have kind of turned out a little bit different for me as I've been preparing this message. The plan was to go on and to look at some of the childhood events of the Lord Jesus Christ as recorded in Matthew and Luke following his birth. And I was continuing on in Matthew's gospel. And uh, the story that comes next there in Matthew chapter 2 is about the visit of the wise men and the star of Bethlehem. And so that's about as far as I got. Uh, I had originally intended on looking at some of the other things as well. Their flight to Egypt and return to Nazareth. And in Luke's gospel, his um, circumcision on the eighth day. And, and so on. And perhaps next week we'll have a look at some of those things. But we're going to focus on Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 this morning. So let's turn there in our Bible. Again, uh, normally this is something that's celebrated uh, with the birth of Christ. Uh, and so it's part of our Christmas celebration. So last month we had, when we looked two weeks ago, we had Christmas in July. If you'd like, you can consider this to be Christmas in August as well. In fact, uh, this uh, narrative took place several months, at least several months after the birth of Christ. Often we see the celebration uh, depicted as the shepherds and the wise men all there in the stable with the newborn baby. Well, in fact, the wise men didn't arrive until uh, a significant period of time afterwards, as we will see uh, today. So we'll look at Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, came from the east, uh, came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet Micah, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least of the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with, his, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to worship this morning, to sing, and to proclaim the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, Father, and we would just entrust this time to the leading of your spirit. Father, we would ask that we would be encouraged, that we would be taught and edified by the word of God. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, one of the first questions that come up in this passage is of who were these wise men, or closer to the original language, the Magi. Well, the Magi go way back uh, into the time of, uh, we see at least the time of Daniel in the Babylonian and Persian empires. These men were religious astronomers. 
They were experts in the study of the star, but they were also religious men. And we see that Daniel, if you turn to your Bible in Daniel's uh, book of prophecy, that Daniel would have had a significant influence on them. And again, you know, we were looking this morning, the breaking of bread, how all things work together for good. Daniel was carried off as a captive when the Babylonian Empire conquered Judah and uh, spent the rest of his life, uh, as far as we know, in um, uh, the Babylonian and Persian empires. And we read in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 48 that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all of the Magi of Babylon. Hmm. Very interesting. We also read in Daniel chapter 6, now the Babylon, Babylonian Empire has been conquered by the Medo-Persians and Darius or Darius is the leader uh, that Daniel is dealing with. And it says in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. And you know how the story goes. The rest of the leaders in Persia did not like that, and they hatched a trap that wound up having Daniel thrown into a lion's den, where indeed he was delivered by the Lord God. And in verse 25, after that deliverance, King Darius reads and writes a decree uh, to all peoples, notice that, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Remember, this was a, a world, a Gentile world empire at the time. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Let me read that part again. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So Daniel was a very influential man during the time of the Babylonian and Persian empires, five to six hundred years before the birth of Christ. What is it? How would he have uh, influenced them? Well, he would have influenced them in what many today would call biblical astronomy. This is where putting together, at least in Daniel's time, the beliefs of Judaism, the beliefs of the Old Testament, and observations in the stars. I'm not talking about astrology. Astrology is all about the zodiac and essentially the worship of stars and believing that the stars are sovereign over our lives and guide our lives depending on what month or zodiac sign we're born under. That's not what we're talking about here. Not at all. That's a perversion, perversion of biblical astronomy. We see in Genesis chapter 1 and 14, if you turn there, that when God made the sun, the moon, and the stars on the fourth day, in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 1, that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And look at this. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. God designed the stars and the planets so that they would be there as signs. Hmm. In Psalm chapter 19, the 19th Psalm, Verses 1 and 2. Give you a second to get there. Familiar psalm, the way that this starts. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. We should not be surprised 
that the heavens and the celestial bodies that are there declare the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Look at this verse two. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. That there is knowledge. There are signs that exist in the night sky. Very, very interesting. And undoubtedly, Daniel would have influenced these uh, Persian religious astronomers, and there would have been traditions that would have been carried on over the five to six hundred years that would have uh, uh, transpired between the time of Daniel and the time of Christ's birth. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 49. This might have been one of the things that would have got their attention. We were just here a couple of weeks ago when we considered the birth of Christ. In verse 10, we considered him as the peace bringer, the Shiloh. But we see in Genesis 49, a prophecy spoken by Jacob, the father of Israel, to his 12 sons. And from verse 8, we see a prophecy concerning Judah, and his heritage, his ancestors. Verse 9 says, Judah is a lion's whelp, or cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, and he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. It would be from Judah that Israel's king would come. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. You remember two weeks ago when we looked at the genealogies of Mary and Joseph in Matthew and Luke, that both of them are descendants from the tribe of Judah. And we also read in Revelation 5 and 5, which Daniel and these Persian religious astronomers, the Magi, would not have had at that time, but that the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I wonder whether or not that would have had some link with the constellation Leo. There's a very bright star. The brightest star that's in Leo is called Regulus. Keep that name in mind. Those names, the constellation Leo and the star Regulus, which is in that constellation. There's another prophecy by an interesting prophet by the name of Balaam. This was the one that had a uh, a bit of a rebellious spirit in him, wanting to make some money from the gift that God had given him, the gift of prophecy. Uh, this was the same prophet that, uh, that the donkey spoke to. Very unusual phenomenon, but there's an inter interesting prophecy that he makes in Numbers chapter 24, and starting in verse 15, Balaam takes up uh, this oracle and says, The utterance of Balaam the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. Look at verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. In other words, I'm seeing the Messiah in the distant future. A star shall come out of Jacob, that is Israel. A scepter, that is a king, shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. Some of that is still future. Balaam's prophecy that Israel, a rising star king, would come out of Jacob. Very interesting. This almost certainly would have been known to uh, Daniel and to these magi. Then there's another one. This one is particularly interesting. Again, we've been in this uh, Jeremiah 23 when we looked at the son of David in the uh, Old Testament part of this series. A very well-known prophecy uh, concerning the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ as the branch of David. In Jeremiah 23 in verse 5 it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh Sekenu. Mysteriously, our brother chose a hymn called Yahweh Sekenu to sing 
earlier this morning in the breaking of bread. There are no coincidences. That name Yahweh Sekenu means the Lord, our righteousness. What does this have to do with astronomy? Well, I'll do a little bit of research on this. It's the Hebrew word Sedek means just and righteous. And that word Sedek is also the Hebrew name for the planet Jupiter, known as the king planet. There's more. The Hebrew word Semach means sprout or upspringing branch. In Arabic, it would be translated El Zimach, which is the name of a star that's in the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. We know that that, that star better by the name Spica, and we see it here on the screen. It's known as, believe it or not, the branch star. Isn't this interesting? That those that would have known Hebrew, there would be this connection. The planet Jupiter and the constellation Virgo and the branch of David. Very, very interesting. What did the Magi say? Let's get back to Matthew chapter 2. We haven't made much uh, progress here. We've only looked at verse 1 and we've been talking about who these Magi might have been. What did they say when they came to Jerusalem? Why did they come to Jerusalem? Well, they were looking for the King, the Messiah. Look what they say. Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? They were confident that the long-awaited and prophesied Messiah, that Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, the list goes on. All of the law and the prophets point to the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that when we studied uh, uh, this in the Old Testament, that he was the expectation as the son of David and the son of man. And they say, where is he that has been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. Hmm. Israel's rising king star, probably referring to Balaam's prophecy in Numbers chapter 24. They also said that they saw his star rising in the east. Very interesting to look at the original Greek words that are translated there, rising in the east. It literally means in the rising. And it refers to a dawn appearance before sunrise. Something, a star, a planet, perhaps both, appearing in the, at the crack of dawn, as my wife would say, before the sun has risen and the birds perhaps are just starting to think about singing and there's something that appears on the eastern horizon. Interestingly enough, there's a reference to the morning star in 2 Peter chapter 2, if you'd like to turn there. Now, of course, these Magi wouldn't have had these New Testament scriptures, but I just want to draw your attention to it. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and chap sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, pardon me, and uh, this reference on your screen is incorrect. It should be 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, not verse 1. I apologize. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That undoubtedly is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, that's right at the end of your Bible, second last or are we not quite the second last, but uh, verse 16, and there's 21 verses in the, uh, in the last chapter of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 22 and 16, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you, John, these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David. There he is, the line of the tribe of Judah. The bright and morning star. What is this morning star that the Magi saw rising in the east that connected them to the birth 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very interesting. The other thing that's interesting here is that the Greek word that's translated rising is the word Anatoly. If you translate that word into Hebrew, guess what? It brings you back to the word Samak, which is the branch star. Samak is this uh, Spica star, which is the brightest star in the Virgin constellation. Here's another link between Jupiter, the king planet, and Virgo, the constellation of the Virgin. Okay, so what did they see? What exactly did they see? Well, this has been the subject of a lot of uh, debate and uh, investigation. We've been really blessed in the last uh, few decades that uh, there is commercial software now that you can actually purchase. One of them is known as Starry Night and it's a, an astronomy computer program that you can track the movement of the stars going forward or backwards and not only stars but planets. There's a fellow by the name of Rick Larson that did this some time ago. We actually watched a documentary, our church, the documentary is called The Star of Bethlehem. It was first released in 2007 and re-released in 2009. And we watched it as a church. It was very, very interesting to see what perhaps these magi saw around the time of the birth of Christ. Well, around 3 BC, things start to get very, very interesting. Between 3 BC and 2 BC, actually in a 16 month period, there were seven conjunctions of planets and stars. A conjunction is when you look up in the sky, in particular in the night sky, keep in mind that stars and planets can appear uh, in the dawn, but they track across the sky as well. Early in the evening, we see them in the western, southwestern horizon, for instance, Jupiter is one of the brightest objects in the sky. You typically see it best early in the evening over on the southwestern horizon. But it will also appear in the morning on the eastern, east, eastern horizon, just above the sun. Of course, Jupiter doesn't have its own light. It reflects the sun's light. But Regulus is a star that emits its own light, and it's in the constellation of Leo. There were three... Uh, conjunctions of Jupiter and Regulus. This means that the two of them actually came together, combining their light. Okay, again, Jupiter reflecting the light of the sun. Three of them. The first one was in September 3 BC, and then there were two more in February and May. There was another conjunction that happened in June of 2 BC between Jupiter and Venus which is typically considered a constellation that's associated with love and fertility. And they uh, had a conjunction again in the uh, um, constellation of Leo, the lion, symbolic of the king. And as I said, in fact, between the end of August 3 BC and uh, uh, 2 BC, there was a 16 month period where various combinations of planets and stars came into conjunction all in the constellation of Leo. This almost certainly would have got their attention. And then the last thing that happened in 2 BC on December 25th, that Jupiter stopped in Virgo for six days. Now you might say, well, how does a planet stop? Planets, of course, are orbiting a, the sun, a star, and their motion in the night sky is very different from the stars. The, the stars track in the sky from night to night, but to the ancient ones, the planets weren't known as planets. They were known as wandering stars because their movement relative to the stars that were around them was somewhat erratic. We understand that now as retrograde motion, that planets like Jupiter and Mars and Venus 
will move from one night to the next relative to the stars that are around them in a somewhat random pattern that actually they'll move in one direction for a period of time and then they'll stop and then they'll move back in another direction. And what we know was that on December 25th was the first of six days where Jupiter actually stopped and started going in another direction and it happened with Jupiter in the midst of the constellation of Virgo where this branch star Spica is. Interesting. Interesting. We don't want to be dogmatic about this but there is certainly a lot of evidence here that this may, and I say may, I don't want to say it dogmatically, may have been what got their attention. So what's the possible chronology? You know, what, what really might have happened here? Well, in the third and second century BC, the Magi, if they were following what was going on in the stars, if they understood the significance of Jupiter as uh, this king planet, as this uh, planet that's associated with the righteousness of Christ in, in Jeremiah 23, and they also they see it coming into conjunction with various planets and stars in the constellation of Leo, which is associated with the lion of the tribe of Judah, it, it would have sent a, a signal to them that indeed the Christ was arriving, that it would signify the proximity of the Messiah's birth. They would begin to travel to Israel, not so much guided by the star, they would have, when they saw this, they would have known that the Messiah was about to be born or had been born in Israel. And of course, Jerusalem would have been the place they would go because that's where the kings lived. That's where Herod was. So they would have seen these things and they would have said, it's time to go to Jerusalem. They may have even been watching some of these things as they were going there. We don't know exactly. And then uh, we see their arrival at Jerusalem and we're reading about that in Matthew chapter uh, 2, was probably sometime late into BC, after these seven conjunctions had taken place over this 16-month period. And they went to Herod, and uh, Herod consulted his uh, wise men, his uh, advisors. It says they're chiefs, chief priests and scribes. Apparently, the wise men didn't know about Micah's, and I'm talking about the Magi that came from Persia, they didn't know about Micah's prophecy that indeed that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem, not in Judah. Bethlehem is not very far from Judah, it's just south of there. Herod talks to them, it says in verse 7, it says that he secretly called the wise men, apart from his the other people, he had a private meeting with the wise men, doesn't say how many there were, we often uh, see, and there is a picture here of three of them, because there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but we're not told exactly how many there were. But he has a meeting with them, and it says that he determined from them what time the star appeared. Hmm. He wanted to know, too, when was he born? Doesn't tell us exactly which one of these events. If we actually... Uh, look at what uh, Mr. Larson has to say in his documentary, The Star of Bethlehem. He has suggested that perhaps it was the first conjunction of um, Jupiter with Regulus in September of 3 BC, may have been when Christ was conceived, and nine months later, if we go back to the, uh, to the previous, I can go back to the previous slide here. Let me just go back here. We see this here in 3 BC. It's actually nine months later in 2 BC, June, which is the normal gestation period of a child, of a human, that Jupiter and Venus come into conjunction. So Mr. Larson suggests that perhaps he was actually born in 2 BC, June. Again, we can't be uh, dogmatic about that. But we see that Herod was very interested as well in when they had seen this star. And then they travel from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It would seem that that would have happened in December of 2 BC. Again, if this is indeed what they had seen. And when they get to Bethlehem, the star, that is this wandering star, Jupiter, 
goes into retrograde motion and it stands still for six days when they arrive at uh, Bethlehem very very interesting it says in verse 9 that the star which they had seen in the east went before them now it wouldn't have been in the east uh, that would have been in the morning they would have seen it rising in the east okay but in the evening they would have seen it basically as they were approaching Bethlehem and it would have been standing over Bethlehem and it would not have been tracking the way that they had seen it track it would have now stopped relative to the stars around it very very interesting and what do they do it says that when they saw the star they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy then they worship we see in verse 11 it says and when they had come into the house notice it was a house not a stable notice that uh, Christ is referred to as a young child in verse 9 and 11 and also in verse 8 so he's not a babe verses 8 9 and 11 all consistently refer to him as a young child at least months old we don't know exactly how old less certainly less than two years old why do we know that because down in verse 16 that when Herod had saw that the wise men hadn't come back to see him that he was deceived by them he was angry and it says he put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under he figured that if I kill all of them between you know two years of age and less that I'll get them that he was born sometime in the last two years which fits uh, those observations in the stars that we've just looked at the other thing that's interesting is that they presented him with gifts and many people refer to these men as kings you know the uh, the hymn we three kings they're not really kings they are magi they are religious astronomers but where did that idea of them being kings come from well if you go back to Psalm 72 Psalm 72 is a Psalm of Solomon or at least for Solomon and it basically speaks of the Messiah's kingdom which is yet future and we read in verses 10 to 11 it says that the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles will bring presents the kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts yes all kings shall fall fall down before him all nations shall serve him friends that isn't fulfilled yet that's what's going to happen during the Millennial Kingdom and yet we see here that when these men came that there were similar things that they did interesting that they brought the king presence and they fell down and they worshiped him foreshadowing ultimately what will happen in the Millennial Kingdom turn to Isaiah chapter 60 we see some more interesting things in Isaiah chapter 60 towards the end of Isaiah's book of prophecy again Isaiah chapter 60 concerns itself with the millennial kingdom the reign of Christ on earth which is still future look what it says in Isaiah 60 and verses 1 2 and 3 arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you Wow that's Christ for behold the darkness shall cover the earth and we were looking at some of that in our Tuesday night study before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord the darkness will come and deep darkness the people but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you the Gentiles shall come to your light and Kings to the brightness of your rising skip down to verse 6 the multitude of camels shall cover your land the dromedaries of Median and Ephah this is why they you see pictures of three Kings coming on camels from the east yeah, book it comes from this passage even although it has its fulfillment in the future still in the kingdom of Christ that will be established this is why we often see them depicted as coming on camels the multitude of camels shall cover your land the dromedaries of Median and Ephah all those from Sheba shall come they shall bring gold 
and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. That's where why you see in some of these pictures camels and kings with their gifts, because it's associated with Psalm 72 and Isaiah 60, even although those passages are not yet fulfilled. We see a bit of a foreshadow. Uh, we often see this, the idea of dual fulfillment, that we had these men, these magi, coming and bringing gifts and worshipping. The first gift was gold. Well, gold is the gift for a king. The second gift was frankincense, which is an incense, which speaks of Christ's deity. And the third was myrrh, which is a spice that's used for embalming the dead. This one is very, very interesting. You can see why they would have brought gold because he was a king. You can see why they would have brought frankincense because if he was the Christ, he was the God-man, the son of David that would reign eternally. They would have believed that he was both king and God. But bringing myrrh? Interesting. If you look in John chapter 19, we're kind of coming to the end here. John chapter 19 and verse 11. I believe it is. Sorry, that reference is incorrect as well. It's John 19 and verse 39. I apologize. There's another error reference in this, uh, in this slide here. It's John 19 and verse 39. It says, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. And this was after Jesus was dead and they were going to bury him. But they brought myrrh and aloes in order to bury him. You know, this is something that we often celebrate when we sing Christmas hymns. Do you remember this one? This Christmas carol, We Three Kings of Orient are. There's three different verses that, that talk about the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And then, the, the, then the, I think it's the fourth verse starts like this. Glorious now, behold him arise, king, gold, God, frankincense, and sacrifice, myrrh. Isn't it interesting that they brought these three things and how they symbolize Christ as both King and God and also his sacrifice? I wonder, did they know what he would do? That he would sacrifice himself? Very, very interesting. In summary, we've had an interesting look at who the Magi were that sought the Christ child and what celestial events may have occurred at the time to lead them to him. The Old Testament scriptures have much to say about the coming of Christ. Undoubtedly, the star-savvy Magi knew some of this and were likely influenced by the prophet Daniel, who lived in Babylon and Persia five to six centuries before Christ's birth. Modern technology allows us to look back at the behavior of celestial bodies around the time of Christ's birth. Several rare events appear to have taken place in 3 to 2 BC involving Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, the star Regulus, Venus, and the constellations Leo and Virgo. These, in combination with the Magi's knowledge of Old Testament prophecy, may have been the events that divinely led them to Christ. And you'll notice that I have the words may have been in italics. We cannot be dogmatic about this, but it sure is interesting using modern technology to look back at what the planets and stars were doing. Those planets and stars, God put them there to declare the glory of the Lord, the Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, that they're there as signs. And so by way of application, 2,000 years ago, wise men earnestly sought and found Christ, being divinely led by scriptures and celestial events. Today, those who are wise continue to seek and find Christ through the guidance of God's Word and His Spirit. Are you wise in that way? Are you seeking Christ through faith? You see, wise men, 2,000 years later, still seek Christ. 2,000 years ago, men looked for and learned about Christ through observing the celestial bodies in God's creation. God set the stars and planets in motion when He created them, so that they would signify and glorify and reveal His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When you observe God's creation, what do you see that signifies and glorifies Jesus Christ? Friends, we need to put on our Jesus glasses and we'll be surprised what we see and learn. Our theme verse, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, 
the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to look into your word and to consider the majesty of the heavens, the stars and the planets and the constellations, all those things that you put there when you made them through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we know that you delight in revealing your Son in the creation, having things there, signs of him, things that speak of him, and you, Father. And Father, we thank you that there were things in the sky that when they were connected with the prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, led these men, these magi, to the Christ child. They knew that the King of Israel had been born. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to look into that this morning. Father, we know that what your word says is true and that we can be steadfast in those things. Some of the other things we've looked at today, Father, we don't know if we've got it exactly right. Exactly right. It's interesting to consider some of these things, but you know exactly how it went down, Father. The gaps in our knowledge, Father, we will just trust that indeed it did happen and that you did arrange the stars and the heavens in such a way to speak of your Son. Father, we thank you for these things. And Father, we would just pray that we'd be encouraged through these things to seek Christ, knowing that he can be found. And in fact, it's him that has found us. You have found us in Christ. Father, we thank you for that, that we can have our sins forgiven. And Father, that we can have everlasting life. And we can also know that we have a heavenly home and a place in your family as heirs. Father, we pray these things and thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.